Witam Państwa bardzo serdecznie. Nazywam się Mateusz Haberski i mam dla Państwa ogromną przyjemność poprowadzić niezwykłą rozmowę z niezwykłym gościem. Jest z nami Clarissa Gunawan, autorka naszej najnowszej powieści w serii z Żurawiem Perfekcyjny świat Miła Kosumidy. To powieść o dziewczynie skrywającej mroczne tajemnice, które w tej powieści stopniowo wychodzą na jaw dzięki trzem bliskim osobom, które opowiadają z różnych perspektyw o tym, kim, czym była, była Miła Kosumida i co się z nią teraz dzieje i czy, gdzie ona teraz jest. Clarissa Gunawan to singapurska pisarka pochodząca z Indonezji, absolwentka szkoły pisarstwa Curtis Brown Creative i uczestniczka projektu mentorskiego Woo Mentoring Project. Jej debiutancka powieść Deszczowe ptaki, która została przetłumaczona na polski, otrzymała Bath Novel Award dla najlepszej nieopublikowanej powieści na świecie, a prawa do jej przekładu zostały sprzedane do 10 krajów. Uh, Clarissa, thank you for, for, for being here, for being via Zoom, and you're, you're in Singapore now, <laughs> right? So it's, and the time, time, uh, time the time delay is quite spectacular. <laughs> so you're in, in the afternoon and I'm still in the morning, so it's really, yes, it's really, over here. yeah, 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 <clears throat> yeah, and, and it's really great. I'm really honored that your novel is in our list and, and we managed to, to acquire the rights to this uh, wonderful, to the second wonderful title of yours, <laughs> uh, which, is, uh, which is a pleasure. And I hope our Polish readers, we have a, uh, we have a really, a, 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 will enjoy a, a great I'm read. I'm so excited about that. <laughs> Good, good, good. Uh, so uh, let's talk about you first, because uh, <laughs> for our Polish readers, this might come as a surprise that you're, uh, uh, as you as you said before the the interview, you're a uh, Chinese, uh, Indonesian, Singaporean writer writing in English about Japan, which is quite exotic itself. Could you please tell me how your multi cultural background and your multicultural uh, your multicultural environment how does it shape your your writing and your experience as a writer well um, I'm a ch I grew up as a Chinese Indonesian so Chinese people who live in Indonesia so I moved to Singapore to study and uh, since I was 16 and after that I just became Singapore and became a Singaporean. Um, in Singapore, we are using English, so it's the main language over here. So that's how we can make it. So it's the most uh, natural thing for me to just write in English. And about Japanese culture, um, I grew up really loving the Japanese culture. So I'm watching the animes, and then I'm reading way too many manga. Manga is a Japanese comics, and also I love reading Japanese novels. Hmm. And um, to me, it's uh, actually when you love to read, maybe say romance novels, you will end up writing in romance novels. Hmm. And if you like to read maybe crime fictions, you will end up writing in crime fictions. And uh, for me, actually, I love reading Japanese novels. So hmm. I guess when I came to write uh, something, I wanted to write the kind of book that I myself will enjoy, the kind of book that I will read over and over and really love it. So, um, because I've been reading all along, I've, I love Japanese literature, so I ended up reading a Japanese, I ended up writing a Japanese novels. So mm. that's, that's how it came to it. And about how this uh, multiple language shapes me. Well, because I grew up in Indonesia, so my first language is not English. Actually, my first language used to be Indonesian. Mm. Now, Indonesia, now English is my first language because I live in Singapore, but my mother's tongue is Indonesian. Uh, so some people actually say that my writing have a translation quality into it. Mm. I used to think that that is a weakness because I feel like oh you want to uh, you want to be a writer and then you need to write um, as someone who is native, someone whose first language is English, whose mother tongue is English. But at the other way, um, actually people told me that no, I think your writing is suitable for the kind of story that you are writing because. Your books is about a frame place, and then there's this translation quality to it that's making it blend so well. So I think, in a way, I think this multiple upbringings and so many different cultures and different languages, I think it 
somehow give me a certain kind of unique um, unique kind of writing that I hope is suitable for the kind of story that I'm telling. Mm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that your <laughs> that your books are set in Japan, but it's not the Japan that that Polish that definitely that Polish readers know from from Japanese novels and from our translations of of, of Japanese novels that we publish at the Aguilera University Press, uh, because your first novel, The Rainbirds, was set in Japan that is bleak and kind of rainy and really kind of more uh, more akin to uh, to London. Uh, like <laughs> like with a, with a, with a foggy a rainy quality of it and and the mystery bit there was just kind of you know a, a, a bit a, a bit dreary and a bit bleak and and the second and your second the the the, the Miwaka Sumida uh, book <clears throat> is more into it's like it's set in in the uh, late eighties in Japan which is another another part of the Japanese culture that Polish readers know virtually anything about, uh, uh, about. so could you please uh, tell us your approach to Japan? What do you appreciate about the Japanese culture so much? Why, why you're, you're so interested in this culture? That you decided to write, and write your novels <laughs> set in, in Japan? I don't know, I guess uh, when it comes to it, the first thing I feel is I really love li reading Japanese books. Somehow there is this certain kind of feel, a certain kind of like evocative feels that things are not really communicated, but I think it's the gap between the words that you feel yourself with your imagination that touch me so much. Mm. So I, I really like these evocative feelings, that kind of the pulses fit with the words, those kind of, um, that's kind of certain feels, it's very hard to describe. But when you read a lot of Japanese novels, somehow you get these certain feels that to me was very unique and somehow it feels connected to me very deeply. So I guess that's what interests me the most. And actually I really love um, the Japanese philosophy in life, like how we should slow down, how we should um, enjoy learnings and how to let go and how to embrace changes, these kind of things. So, um, and I think as I grew up, uh, because my previous culture, like Chinese Indonesian, we always try to do things fast. We want to be as fast as possible. We want to be competitive, but the Japanese philosophy is really about it's like slowing down, so let's enjoy learning, so let's live in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. and let's give thanks. So I think as I grew older, oh, I'm not saying I'm really old, but <laughs> as I'm growing older, I think I grew to appreciate this kind of approach. So mm -hmm. I think that's, that's the other things that I used to to write. And to me, my book is like I say, it's the kind of book that I, I actually wrote for myself, something I really, really love. So actually, I will write about the kind of philosophy, the kind of feels that I want to remember. I guess it's something mm -hmm. like that. And how much, how much do you research your books? How much do you, how much research do you put into, into the work? Uh, in, in, like mm -hmm. the research about the Japanese culture? I guess uh, when we talk about research, we often think about, oh, in terms of years, like this certain period, one year, two years, things like that. But to me, it's not really a, it's not really a period of time. It's more like a process because I grew up uh, reading a lot of comics and reading a lot of, uh, and seeing a lot of anime. So I feel like it has been with me since a very long time. And it's something that I still continue to learn until now. I mean, I'm learning Japanese language and uh, I'm also learning like kimono wearing and tea ceremony. And there is always uh, something new to learn. There's no stop. So in terms of research, it's continuous. There's no, there's no beginning, there's an end. I mean, you can say it begins when I start to love the Japanese cultures, but there's really no end into it. And every day, I think I discover more things uh, each time I, uh, read something new and actually I learned mm -hmm. something more. So the of research is to me is a continuous process. But uh, pertaining to the book itself, there's some things that you just don't really know. For, ex uh, for instance, in Rainbirds, there is a scenery in the funeral. Mm -hmm. A funeral is not something that is you commonly see in anime or in drama or in manga. So it has to be something that I went to the books and do a lot of readings, what mm -hmm. the funeral mm -hmm. life they usually do and uh, architecture also, how's the house in that period on time and things like that. So um, yeah, I mean, there are research specific to the book, but on the whole itself, I think it has to be a continuous process. And of course, uh, down the road, you will 
hopefully knows more and more and become more of our wives. But I think when it comes to learning, I think the more you know, the more you realize you don't really know. I mean, mm. I, I wonder oh. if that makes sense. Mm. But that's what mm. I do too. Mm. Mm. Uh, and and how about the, how about the choice of uh, of uh, of the convention of the of, of the writing style that you that you adopt for your novels? Because in in Rainbirds you you were flirting with uh, with the thriller mystery a uh, bit, and and the and the perfect world of Miyaka Sumida is a is a mystery novel of sorts about this character that it's kind of you know uh, veiled in this kind of fog of 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 of, of a mystery uh, why do you choose this those those literary genres actually i always find it confusing when people ask me what kind of book it is because it's like well there's a love but i can't mm. really say it's a roman story mm. well there's people who died but you can't really see that you feel that there is a you know there's a murderer that is running around going to kill someone you don't feel that thrilling feeling mm. i mean uh, most people will just say oh it's literary fiction but literary fiction is such a big genre it can be anything it can be whatever it is but I always feel like, um, for me itself, I mean, I, I just write it without really thinking about what this is book going to be. Um, when I write it, I really just plan to write the kind of book I love and not really thinking about the marketing parts. Of but when course, it yes. to be acquired by the publishers and they start to ask me, like, why should we put this? Yeah. And I was like, um, I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> some mm. of them mm. actually put it in a crime section, but some yeah, of them put it in literary fractions. Yeah. But what I'm asking about is just uh, why is this genre for you? Like this, uh, or no, I'm not talking, I, I'm not thinking about this mystery bit as a, as a genre per, per se, but rather as a, as a tool to achieve something. What does it uh, allow you to achieve, literary wise? Uh, I think for me, when it comes to uh, books, I think each book needs to have a questions. Maybe mm. that's or maybe that's where the mystery came from. And I always feel like a lot of times, I think people usually it's not what you think they are. You see, mm -hmm. there is a layer that is deeper, uh, deeper than whatever we can see the surface. So I think this kind of questions. Uh, one of the themes that I always feel keep on coming out in my writing is that: Do we really know that? persons mm, and um, mm. how far do we want to go to uncover the truth and what mm. if the truth is something that we don't we really not know so this this question is something that I, I realize that it's actually found over and over in my writings but if you ask me uh, is that something conscious decision it's not a conscious decision but more yeah. because when as I write I start to notice this kind of pattern and so, mm, okay, so mm. it seems like there's always a questions and sometimes the question don't even have an answer, but I think that's part of life. Sometimes we just don't have an answer, mm. but um, mm. I still uh, want to, that I want to do in writing. I still want to have this a sense of hope mm. and also to learn to let go. And sometimes it might be, it might not be the 100% outcome that we want, but mm. still we try to, you know, uh, look up in life. And I still want that positivity, that energy, that hope, that redemptions to be present in my writing, even though it's bleak or there's a lot of rain. By the way, I like rain, <laughs> mm, mm. but there's still some hope. It's not like the kind of dreary, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the world is ending, but mm. no matter how bad situation is, there's always a silver. Mm, mm, mm. And I and I've got the impression that in the in the perfect world of Miwaka Sumida, you explore this the potential of this mystery to go deeper into the characters or the human psychology to explore those uh, dreary and bleak uh, recesses of the human soul, I would say, and, and the human identity as well, without much, without much, <laughs> uh, uh, without much giving away. Uh, one of the characters in your novel is transgender. Uh, so you've got this fluidity as well uh, when it comes to uh, the questions about the identity in many sorts of ways. Uh, so, how do you uh, how do you think about the human being or the characters of yours? What, what's your approach to your characters in in terms of their identity? How do you uh, approach this this uh, this topic? I think there are writers who plot, and mm. there are writers who don't plot, and I'm the writers that don't plot. 
and a lot of the time when it comes to my characters, I don't know who they really are. I don't know why they do what they do. But as I write along with you, I get to find out their identity. And somehow, I think it sounds like a little bit like, what, what, what is this, like Jumbo Mambo kind of thing. But uh, usually as I write, somehow I get to know them more. And, and sometimes I feel like, uh, for example, in Rainbirds, I have problems understanding the sisters, why she made that, uh, why she made that uh, decision. So actually I wrote a novel based on a sister that will never get published. Mm. find out why she did what she did so um i always feel like as a writer it's like a, you know the iceberg in titanic mm. you might only see mm. what's on top but in the below there's a lot more than that the reader might not really know why the sister why did what she did or why she made these decisions what her past look like but mm. i feel as a writer we have to know our characters so intimately we have to know everything about them their secret their fears uh, their worries and everything so to me, my approach of characters is always to write more about them and write more. The more I write, the more I understand them, the more I actually, uh, the more I get to know their identity. Mm. So if you've got three narrators in the, the Miwaka Sumida bit, have you written like three novels about them just to get them, get to know them or not really? <laughs> Not exactly three novels, but I can tell you that I write freely more than that and I cut a lot. So like, mm. um, I think Rainbow at one point was like 200,000 and the final one is 80,000. And there is also another novel which is 60,000. So actually I cut about 300,000 of story that will never make it there. Amazing, yeah. Yeah, for Rimaku, actually I did cut and put in and cut and put in. I didn't really count the words, so I believe there's a lot of things that didn't make the cut. Mm. But I still need to write them. I wouldn't say that, oh, that's wasted. Uh, I read something and then I don't use it. There's no such thing on wasting when it's come to mm. writing. Because I have to know them. And that is my way to get to know my characters. Mm. By mm. Entrusting everything to them. And, you know, just let them reveal themselves to me. Mm -hmm. And how about the choice of the of the themes that you explore in the Miwaka Sumida book? Because they are quite uh, serious stuff about sexual abuse, about transsexual identity and, and problems uh, with this um, because I understand that they're not really conscious choices of yours but having written having written the book that you that you wrote uh, do, you, do you do you recognize it as an important uh, a, a stand in the in the current debate or something uh, is it important for you in this socio-political way or not or not at all um actually when it, there is a lot of difficult topics that came up with um a lot of people say that oh why do you write this kind of thing mm. to me uh, just because this topic are difficult it doesn't mean that we have to stay away from them and actually that's how i was raised last time by my family it's like we don't talk about difficult stuff we don't talk about religions we don't talk about stories of sex and this kind of thing this is not the kind of thing that we should be talking but i feel like we need to talk about them because these are issues that are real and issues that i see every day in my friends or people that i know and I mean, just because they are difficult, we shouldn't just not talk about them. We should talk about them so that there's more awareness, so that we know when is, uh, what should have been done and what should not be done because the world is not ideal right now. We wanted a better representation, better, uh, better diversity. We wanted a more equal rights. And I think it's very important to talk about them. I mean, no issues like bullying is serious and how uh, girls or children are being pressurized uh, in school. and. This kind of competition is very real and a lot of people say try to shy away but I feel as a writer you should be brave and you should write mm. what you're afraid about. I mean, mm. Even in school I experienced being bullied before and I, I'm also taking part in the groups. I mean I saw how difficult it is sometimes when we see friends getting bullied but we didn't really want to stand up because we didn't want to get bullied too. And all these issues are real and yeah basically I feel that we should not be afraid. We should uh, we should talk about them, and mm. um, it shouldn't be something that is so taboo. Or, or we should avoid them because um, when we just put uh, all these difficult issues under the mat, we thought that it's gone, but it's actually it's not gone. It's being repressed. Mm. So it's better to be open, and then we have an open dialogue. We have a better understanding, and you know, as a society, hopefully, we grow to be a better person. Mm. 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 
Yeah, I think we should apologize our viewers for not for not talking about Miwako Sumida, who is in the title of your book, but she's like a she's like a like a void character or like a black hole that is kind of it's empty and uh, and full at the same time. Uh, do you have a do you have a way of talking about Miwako Sumida without giving much further away about her? To just how would you how would you talk about <laughs> <laughs> How would you talk about your main character who's, you know, uh, who's the, you know, the trigger of, of events in the book? Yes, um, I think yesterday I just started on, well, this girl told me that suicide is a big secret because if you see the back of the cover, it's already there. If you see the side of the suicide, it's not really a spoiler. <laughs> so basically, Nima Kasumira is a young girl that on the surface, her life looks all right. She has friends, and she has a guy that likes her so much. And she has a job, she's been doing things well. And suddenly, so one day, she just committed suicide. And of course, people are wondering why did she do what she did? And do we really know her as a person? So, this story is being told from different people uh, around her. One is a guy who is a uh, woman lover, another one is her best friend, and another one is some sort of mentor. So they actually have a different uh, image of what kind of person Miwaku is and each of them are telling their, uh, their own versions. And we also see how her death is affecting others around her. So I think when someone left, it's not just about herself, but it's also the point that she left behind and that, how that point is creating a repulse to those people around her. Mm. So yeah. Okay, that's not very short. Yeah, 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 but that's, you know, that's... Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> this much we can tell about Miwako Sumida because otherwise <laughs> we, would, we would have to go into details and this would be spoiling the, the, novel, for, <laughs> the novel for our readers. And uh, yeah, but... Uh, yeah. but uh, so, um, and I wanted to ask you about uh, another thing um, about Miwako Sumida and this supernatural quality and supernatural events are happening in your in your novels or or so that so they seem to be supernatural what's your and this is obviously this is a, a great part of the of the of the japanese tradition the supernatural and the the, the kind of the blurred blurred boundary between between the supernatural and the and the so-called normal world what's your approach to to the supernatural in your novels <coughs> Actually, uh, even in real life, I find there's many things that seem mundane but so magical. Mm. Like sometimes I will just dream of something and then in my dream I will remember, oh, this is something that happened before. Or sometimes I will walk on the street and then I feel like, hmm, I've been dreaming about this place, I've been here before, but actually I haven't been there. So I always find that there is this always this magical quality in our everyday life and some people call it coincidence. Some call it a deja vu, or whatever they call it. I always found that there is always this pinch of magical there, but at the same time, um, it's not really a full blown fantasy. So it's just to me, it's like cooking, and you just put a little bit of salt there. So mm. to me, this magical realism things is just a tinge of it that works just nice for their book. Not mm. too much, but there's still a little, and somehow okay. it's enriched the whole thing. So that that's what I feel like this. <laughs> hmm. Mm. Uh, so uh, actually, we we peppered uh, to, to 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 be in this cooking uh, the cooking <laughs> mode. So we we peppered our, our talk and our interview with with those uh, genres. So there is a thriller, there is a the crime, there is a a mystery, and that now magical realism. So uh, <laughs> yes. can I can I ask you about your your influences, literary wise, in terms of authors? Um. I like to read Japanese novels, so I think it's quite obvious. Mm, mm, but in terms mm. of what kind of Japanese novels, I read mainly literatures, and the other side is a mystery. So I guess maybe that's why whatever I read is a blend of these two. Also, oh. like crime, um, but more like the um, up my favorite kind of Japanese crime. Uh, if I, if you don't mind me dropping names, I like of course, uh, on of the course. literary side. <laughs> I like things like. Uh, People like Banana Yoshimoto, Yoko Ogawa. I think Yoko Ogawa is great because it's so versatile, different books, it's different feel. Mm. Also, like Haruki Murakami, I mean, he's super famous, everyone knows him. Mm. Um, there's also 
new arrivals like for example Hiromi Kawakami and then there's also uh, a lot of younger female writers Mieko Kawakami and they're coming up very strongly and their voices is very rich and very strong from the literary side I think mm -hmm. that's awesome from the crime side uh, I like people like uh, Fuminari Nakamura and also I like things like uh, Keiko Higashino so it's more like uh, mysteries but uh, quite uh, the deep kind of mystery that is not just about solving games but there's also characterizations there. Um, Yukinia Bay also great. So I think, yeah, this you said it is so general, the one I go to. The river side actually is tend to be a lot of uh, a teach of magical realism. I mean, there's some kind of magic, but it's not a dragon kind of magic. It's more mm -hmm. like everyday life kind of magic that is, you know, just nice for the book. So mm -hmm. I guess, yeah, those, those are the kind of books I love to read and maybe that's why it, Mm. come to my writings mm. yeah, really think that whatever you read is really influencing whatever you uh, whatever you write mm. Mm. so do you, do you carefully choose your books to write to read while writing a novel or not really not really carefully but it's more like you tend to uh, if you like this author you tend to read all his books mm. and then people say oh this is quite similar to the author that you like and then you end up picking that book and then sometimes uh, they say, oh, this one is in the similar genre and you end up picking there. And also I think friends, I mean, I have a lot of friends who like similar books and then they tell me, oh, Clarissa, I think you like this book and then I read it. So it's end up that um, there is a wide repertoire, but it's around this genre. I wouldn't say that I'm closing off myself because sometimes I also read like something totally different. Mm, <laughs> but uh, mm. usually there, there is a certain genre that is so called my comfort read kind of thing. Yeah. So like, whenever I feel that, I know I wouldn't be disappointed. You know? Of course, <laughs> yes. Really, yeah. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and thank you very much for dropping names because, uh, because this is, this is a, a great coincidence that <laughs> Many of you, of the authors that you that, that you mentioned, they they they've actually been translated uh, into Polish, and now oh. now they're really no, uh, well known figures. For, for instance, the Fuminori Nakamura book, The Thief. The Thief. Yes, was... yes, The Thief. That's my favorite book actually of him. Yeah. I mean, I read yeah. all his books, but The Thief is my favorite. Yeah. So really this is just uh, this has just uh, come out in Poland, so it's really. Really good oh, to great. good to give the Polish our readers uh, like <laughs> feel of your you know literary imagination literary <laughs> kind of vibe that 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 that, that they, they they might expect from your novels and I think this is this is really important so uh, just uh, just coming to an end of our interview what's your next project can you can you give us a sneak peek uh, a, a <laughs> sort of uh, I, I think um, my next novel is also is going to be quite similar of the setting is still going to be set in Japan and as always you can expect like some sort of mysteries or literary kind of mysteries there's always a question there's also a thing that is not like what it seems to be and as mm. always there's always just a nice hint of magic I guess okay okay so this is a this is good to, uh, uh, let's see how how it goes and I hope uh, our Polish readers will get the chance to read your next novel at the Jagiellonian University Press and, uh, oh. and, let, and let's hope you and let's hope they will jo enjoy the perfect world of Miwaka Sumida which is uh, hey, I hope you guys will like it <laughs> thank you very much it was a, a real pleasure talking to you and uh, and uh, and yeah I hope we'll we'll get the chance to to talk uh, again in the future Yes, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.